Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. My name is Zach. Um, as you can see, my pronouns are he and him. And uh, if you're new to the channel, uh, give you a little idea of what we do. So every week on Fridays at 7 p.m., we like to read a chapter of a leftist uh, audiobook together. And I'll pause and, and comment on, on it, and I'll, uh, you know, react to your comments as well. You know, it's, it, it should be a real interactive sort of a thing. Um, so tonight we have a, our next chapter of uh, The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the, like, uh, fathers, you might say, of anarcho-communist theory. Uh, he wrote this book just about 130 years ago. Uh, he, he lived through... Um, a bunch of the revolutions in uh, France. Uh, he's, I, I believe he lived to see the Russian Revolution, and uh, but he wrote this book long before that point. Um, so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna check out uh, chapter fifteen. Only have uh, this plus three more chapters to go. So it's uh, we're getting towards the end of it here. Um, if you've been following along, you know, uh, some of the key themes have been things like investing the revolution in the revolutionaries. So in, 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 in times of, of actual revolution, where there's a, a government turnover, uh, instead of spending all of your time and energy kind of uh, jockeying for position, setting up new, um, what do you want to call it, uh, like... Uh, hierarchies and, and, and bureaucracies and that sort of thing. Uh, instead, you should be spending your time fulfilling the promises of the revolution. So if you promised everyone that they would have all the necessities of life, as, as Kropotkin has been talking about through these chapters here, then uh, that's what you set about doing first. Uh, you give them housing, you make sure they have food and clothing, and you make sure that, that these sorts of things continue to be produced uh, without any, any uh, sort of masters taking over and, and profiting off the labor of their workers, um, but instead give the, the ownership of these means of production to the people themselves, the workers themselves. And uh, some other themes that he talks about are doing away with, with currency. He believes that if you don't do away with currency, that's just going to end up reintroducing hierarch hierarchy and... Um, disparate power relationships and that sort of thing back into society. He, he thinks it's an inevitable backslide uh, that, that's going to occur. Uh, and we, we've talked about uh, recently some of the, the alternative theories, um, ideas of quantifying uh, people's labor and compensating them with labor notes in, instead of dollars. So, you know, X hours of labor gives you the, so many notes. And, and he was, a, you know, Kropotkin was criticizing that as uh, just a, another form of currency that, that would, again, lead to hierarchies and people hoarding power while, while others went without. Uh, so now this week, we are going to be talking uh, about the division of labor. Um, so this is... Uh, a very short chapter. Um, I'm not quite sure how long the chapter after is. I'm going to take a look real quick here. So this chapter is only about seven minutes. So we may even do chapter 16. Uh, it kind of depends on, on the pace of things and, and uh, you know, how often there's interesting stuff coming up to, to comment on. So we may do 15 and 16 tonight. We'll, we'll see. Um, and so... In addition to these, these Friday nights where we talk about theory, uh, I also do Sunday nights at around 7 p.m., usually Central Standard Time, although that's been varying a lot based on what I have going on during Sundays because I finally have those free again. I no longer work on the weekends, so that's nice. Uh, but they've, they've been a little bit more open, and, and, uh, and also the format has, has tended to be open on Sunday nights as well. Uh, so I talk about... A wide variety of things from usually we pick a, a YouTube video of some kind, whether it's someone I agree with, someone that I, I really don't agree with that I'm, I'm going to uh, mock and pull apart their arguments about or just kind of whatever comes up. Um, so it's a lot more loose and casual. But but Friday night is for theory so far. That's the way it's been. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. You know, don't don't worry about uh, 
breaking the stride of the, the chapter or anything like that. I always enjoy feedback from the audience and, and you know, getting those other perspectives about uh, what you're thinking about the chapter um, or, or related issues to, you know, maybe you have something going on in your life today that uh, relates to something that we're talking about. That's, that's a perfect time to bring that up as well so we can uh, generate more discussion. Um, so I think we're going to get started pretty quickly here. Um, I think I've pretty much covered any everything except for I'm going to show you real quick my uh, contact information. So depending on where you're hearing or reading this or, or, or seeing this, I should say, um, you should know that I am on uh, Twitch at, at, the, at the scheduled times that I mentioned. Uh, 7 o'clock Friday nights, as well as around afternoon, we'll say afternoon to evening on Sunday nights, and, and that 7 o'clock is Central Standard Time. Um, but then I also put my videos out onto YouTube. You can search for Bread Theory, and I'm on Twitch as Bread underscore Theory, as well as, as Facebook. You can, those are the two main places where I'm going to put out uh, alerts about what I'm doing, uh, as well as you know interact with the community more outside of streams and then I also have a podcast um, so let me just pull up my my link tree right here if there's anything that you are particularly interested in uh, any format that you like more than another here's the place to find all of that sort of thing let me just uh, adjust that screen one second here and you can see for yourself if you are in fact watching and not listening on the podcast uh, so all you have to do is go to linktr dot ee uh, slash bread underscore theory, and you can find my link tree to all my different places, all the different social media things that I have going on, as well as other projects and groups that I'm a part of. Uh, so I encourage you to go and check that out. Um, and if you're if you are watching live on the stream and you haven't done so uh, uh, yet. I, I encourage you to go ahead and follow. You know, it doesn't cost anything to, to follow. And I'm trying to build up towards getting an affiliate position so I can actually start taking subscriptions and maybe start to actually monetize this channel. That, that, that's my dream for right now. Let's pull up the, the Conquest of Bread. It's just going to be a blank screen right at the moment, so I'll put that one back on. Um, so yeah, please give me a like and, uh, and a follow, depending on, on how you're watching this or where you're watching this or listening to. Um, and as, as also as far as the podcast goes, uh, it is I put it out through Anchor, but it's available on, on all the major uh, podcasting apps. So you should be able to find it wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. All right, well, let's get into the chapter tonight. And again, the title, oh, I'm going to adjust that just a little bit, that frame. There we go. The title of this week's chapter is The Division of Labor. So let's see what Kropotkin says, has to say about the division of labor. Here we go. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 15 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. <laughs> For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oh, yes, and, and LibriVox the Conquest is of Bread by uh, one note on LibriVox. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, app as well as a website. You can listen to tons and tons of free audiobooks, including many, many leftist theory books. You know, it's all stuff that's in the public domain, so you're generally, thinking, you're generally looking at stuff that's, that's more than 100 years old, unfortunately for some. Uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to get more modern opinions, uh, they don't have that except for for uh, paid uh, versions uh, but it's, it's a wonderful website and also you can find them on YouTube uh, as well and uh, I always enjoy the little <laughs> pictures they put up with uh, each uh, chapter so we have our little I guess I guess that would be like a bread link basically I think he even has a little triangle in his his um, I don't know, satchel bu buckle I guess you call it um, uh, so yeah, I just thought that was a little bit funny that I'd mention that, and let's keep going. Peter Kropotkin, Chapter 15, The Division of Labor. 
Political economy has always confined itself to stating facts occurring in society and justifying them in the interest of the dominant class. Thus, it is in favor of the division of labor created by industry. Having found it profitable to capitalists, it has set it up as a principle. Look at the village smith, said Adam Smith, the father of modern political economy. If he has never been accustomed to making nails, he will only succeed by hard toil in forging two to three hundred a day, and even then they will be bad. But if the same smith has never done anything but nails, he will easily supply as many as 2,300 in the course of a day. So you can, you can possibly guess where we're going to be headed with this chapter. He's kind of trying to pick apart the idea that you can quantify any given sort of labor by the number of hours that it takes to accomplish. So obviously, if you're super skilled at what you do, and you can just breeze through it real, real quickly, whatever the work may be, um, I myself am a, am a landscaper. I can, I can uh, pick out plans for a design and uh, assemble things in my mind a lot better than people that have had no training in the field. Um, I can also plant those plants probably a lot faster because I know, I know the tools, I've, I've used them. And if I were to just be paid uh, you know, strictly on an hourly basis, which I, which I am, but if, if you know, whenever that labor was, was complete, I, I didn't have anything else to do and I just had to go home, well, I would, be paying, I would be paid less based on my skill level than someone who just started out who struggles, you know, uh, even identifying what's a weed to pull out. You know, someone who's never considered that, that some grasses we, we like in, in, in certain places and some grasses people tend not to like in certain places. Um, or, you know, what uh, the various other types of weeds look like. You know, for them, it's going to take them a lot longer. So should they be paid a lot more because their labor takes a lot longer? Um, so he's, he's starting to kind of poke holes in the idea of just having hours represent uh, being a... a you know, a representative of one's labor, like some sort of universal standard. Um, because it's not. People are individuals with individual skill levels. And Smith hastened to the conclusion, quote, divide labor, specialize, go on specializing. Let us have smiths who only know how to make heads or points of nails, and by this means we shall produce more. We shall grow rich, unquote. That a smith sentenced for life to the making of heads of nails would lose all interest in his work would be entirely at the mercy of his employer with his limited handicraft, would be out of work four months out of 12, and that his wages would decrease when he could be easily replaced by an apprentice. So he's, uh, he's also talking about the specialization of labor, and, and that's, that's a, um, perhaps a different way of, of dividing labor than you're used to. Maybe you think of division of labor as, as um, between, between the sexes, or, or the genders, I guess is a more accurate way of putting it. Um, or, or, you know, uh, some other conception of it. But he, he's talking about specialization here. So, yeah, that that Smith, that 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 Smith that's uh, being referenced here, he may be very good at, at a particular type of of production of nails. But if he's going to spend his entire life just doing that one thing, he's he's going to go, you know, crazy basically. Um because it's just so monotonous. It, it takes the joy out of, out of the variety of, of getting good at different things and doing different things. Just having, you know, they say variety is the spice of life. Not to mention that, that when you super specialize tasks to where like uh, one worker on an assembly line is just, you know, placing uh, the doll's hair into the doll's head. Another one puts the arms on and all they do all day is arms, arms, arms. That repetitive stress wears bodies down very quickly. You know, your body's not designed to do the exact same motion for hour upon hour, day after day. That's one of the things that I really enjoy about landscaping is that, you know, from day to day, I'm going to be doing a lot of different things. I may be doing mulch one day. I may be doing planting a different day. I may be just doing weeding. Um, and, and that varies based on the, the terrain. If I'm weeding in uh, gravel, if I'm weeding on wood chips or just in an open dirt field or whatever um there's variety and and not only is it, it mentally stimulating but but physically i'm not having to use the exact same muscle groups for every single task so although it is physically demanding work i never get completely worn out or at least no part of me gets completely worn out um by keeping that that variety so 
he's, he's, he's talking about how it's a r rather dismal prospect for someone who's a master of their craft to have to do just one specified thing, even if it is, quote unquote, more, more efficient. And, uh, and of course, we know now that uh, that efficiency again and again is always captured by the people that own the means of production, the owner class. So if you say we're working on a, a let's, let's go back to the factory, you're working on that doll line, you figure out a way to on, automate part of that process. You could end up saving the company, the company like millions of dollars a year, potentially, depending on how big their operation is. You don't get a dime of that. You know, you figured that out on their time. Uh, there's, there's probably something in your employment contract. I mean, it, there may or may not be, but there's probably something in the law, at least, that says that if you, you know, invent something and um, while well, you're being employed by a certain uh, company, that, that they own that, that intellectual property. That, that certainly is the case with, say, medical devices. If you are a university student and, and you're studying, say, medical device research, Whatever you come up with at that university, as long as it's a public university, and I, I would assume the same would be true of private, but whatever you come up with, because you're using uh, the university's facilities, you're, you're using the knowledge that you gain from your classes, they take that and, and use that for their own profit. You know, they own the patents to whatever you create at the, in that space. Oh, hello, Ali Osher. Uh, good evening to you as well. Uh, everyone, please follow Ali Osher. You can just click on their their uh, name right there. Um, they are a very cool uh, streamer of leftist politics. Um, been been doing a lot lately that I've been seeing. Uh, they uh, talk a lot about you know if there's a, a press conference or something like that, um, especially on, on the federal level. They'll they'll do coverage of that as well as uh, a lot of disability rights advocacy, which I find very crucial. Uh, that's, that tends to be one of those groups that um, perhaps even activists don't always consider when they're talking about things like intersectionality, but they should. That, that's, that's another class of people uh, that have unique challenges that are systemically imposed on them. You know, you ever tried getting around a city in, in a wheelchair before? If, if that's not something that you're used to, I'm sure you come to look at the city in a very different way. You would notice every crack in the sidewalk, every place where there's no, you know, uh, ramp down the curb where you just have to like, you know, kachunk it right down or up, you know? So I think these, I, I, I love that they, uh, look at these issues. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, go ahead and follow Ali Osher. Very great streamer. Um, so yeah. Uh, Requities. I saw the sandwich and had to stop by. Yeah, I, it looks like someone has has drawn a a loaf link. I guess that's the best way of putting it. He he looks to be based on uh, the Legend of Zelda character Link. And we are of course talking about the conquest of bread. So that's why <laughs> that image is up there at all. Uh, by uh, the the book is by Peter Kropotkin, and it, it talks about some anarcho communist theory. So I hope you're uh, uh, intrigued by that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's funny, too. Um, yeah, and if you guys have any questions as we're, we're streaming along here, feel free to, to shout, it, shout them out. And, you know, I always love more participation from the audience. Um, we, we learn together better when we increase the number of perspectives that we're learning from. I think that's a, a good way of going about things, something I believe in. Uh, what is the conquest of bread? Oh, oh okay, so... I guess I've kind of explained it. So yeah, anarcho-communist theory. That's what we're talking about tonight. Um, a particular strain of leftism, but it, you know, it can be broadly applied to basically any sort of, of leftist thought, anything from socialism to communism to anarchy to just general you know, egalitarian leftism. I think there's uh, stuff that's applicable for everybody. Uh, personally, do not like communism or anarchy, but yeah, that's fine. You don't have to like it. Um, that's, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm always open to uh, other people being in the chat and being part of the community here, as long as you can uh, be respectful. The only kind of people that, that aren't welcome here are uh, trolls, basically. So as long as you can uh, keep things respectful and uh, we have more of a, a dialogue, I'm not too interested in, in like uh, debate bro sort of thing. 
with we we have winners and losers uh, based on who can posture the best or have the, the best zingers or that sort of thing. I don't think that gets us any closer to any sort of understanding or truth about anything. So let's see. The leftism, yeah, that's fine. A centrist, that's cool. Um, I, I hope you stick around for a little bit and, and at least get to see what uh, other people are sort of thinking about and uh, the sort of ideas that we're grappling with. So, yeah. Cool. I'm glad you can respect that atmosphere. That, that's, that's very gracious of you. So I, re I really do appreciate that. Uh, but let's continue the chapter a little bit and see what else he's, he's going to talk about here with the division of labor. Smith did not think of it when he exclaimed, quote, Long live the division of labor. This is the real gold mine that will enrich the nation, unquote. Okay, and again, for those of you just joining us, uh, the division of labor that he's talking about is, is basically specialization um, as, as, as well as, you know, dividing. It's, it's the idea of having the, the, uh, the factory belt line where every station does one thing again and again and again. And because each one of those things is done very quickly and efficiently, you know, it adds up to, to a lot of efficiency. And he's, he's kind of skeptical of that point of view. He thinks it, it robs people of the joy of, of variety in their work. Um, and that while it may be technically more efficient, it's, it's going to be at the cost of the, the people performing that labor. And I, I would tend to see that as a truth. Um, you know, I apologize. I didn't have closed captioning on. I'm going to put on the closed captioning here. We're going to see how it goes. Usually, uh, closed captioning is, is good with um, uh, this particular channel, um, especially this, this particular speaker tends to be very uh, clear. But if, but if things go bad, if, if, if I'm having to correct the, the closed captioning, I think you're just going to have to rely on, on, on Twitch's CC instead. But we'll see how it goes. And all joined in the cry. And later on, when a Sismondi or a J.B. Say began to understand that the division of labor, instead of enriching the whole nation, only enriches the rich, and that the worker... Right, and, and we were just talking about that, how these efficiencies are great, but if you're not in any sort of position as a worker to decide what happens to the profit, um, then what good is it to you? The, the, the owner is going to give you whatever your contract says they're supposed to give you. And it doesn't matter if you increase efficiency, decrease efficiency, as, as long as, as they're getting paid and the company's you know, chugging along, it, it makes no difference to you personally uh, because you have no say in that. So what anarchy, what these different left I ideas uh, tend to concentrate around is the idea that the workplace should be more uh, free egalitarian and democratic so that everyone has a say not in every single thing that happens it's not as though anytime there's a decision to be made you have to stop the entire operation and get together and have long lengthy debates about what needs to happen but the the kind of broad stroke things such as rate of pay working conditions uh any sort of benefits you get the things that affect you as a worker um and also where the profit goes and how it's being divvied up, whether it's going to be for future investments, whether you're going to divvy it among workers in whatever way people come up with. Those are sorts of things that you should be able to vote on because they affect you directly and because you are contributing to that overall operation. Um, if any one part of that system gets pulled out of place and the entire thing crumbles, that means you're a vital part. And if you're a vital part, you should have a say. Um, and just in general, democracy uh, is, is generally thought of as a good thing. I would think it's a good thing. Why not in the workplace? The workplace right now under capitalism is pretty top down. Um, you might even say authoritarian in, in a very negative way uh, where you have people that sit at the top that make all the decisions about um, who gets to even work there, how much they get paid, what all their benefits uh, can and cannot be um, and at best you have a union to act as kind of you know a counterpunch against that to fight for your rights as a worker what a lot of leftists want and, and you know some leftists are okay with just leaving it at unionism but I, I particularly am not and I don't think any anarchist would be either uh, as well as, as most 
even the democratic socialists. When, when most people talk about democratic socialism, they want democracy in the workplace. Um, that means workers having an equal say in these very important uh, workings of whatever business they are a part of because they are vital to it. It, it just seems like a, a fair trade-off. If you're going to have to have people help you make your money, you should at least give them an equal say in these important things. Otherwise, just do it yourself. You know, be an entrepreneur. And again, this, this doesn't preclude entrepreneurial people. You can still just have a business of one or, you know, I don't think anyone would really quibble about having a, a small family business or that sort of thing. Um, because you're never going to get so big that you exert an undue force on everybody else. Um, and that's, that's one of the dangers of allowing so much power to concentrate, even in the private sector, is that they can end up having an undue force on society at large, you know, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's only natural that if you have a lot of power and you have the power to maintain that power, your natural tendency is going to be to want to maintain that. If for no other reason, then like you're the you're the good person with the power and you want to make sure that these other people who are bad people with power are kept at bay. Um, so it's, it's a natural inclination uh, to want to maintain your power if you have it. But at the same time, you know, it's not democratic. It's not. Uh, it's, it, it just happens to be a system that, that works best for the people that already have the power, which doesn't mean they're necessarily the best at the job. Um, or, or worthy of running the operation as an autocrat, basically. Um, so yeah, I want a, a more egalitarian society where every person is, is given a platform through, by, give, by being given the basic necessities of their life, um, you know, food, water, shelter, clothing, uh, education, transportation, communication, community, th these sorts of things. Everyone is given that platform to stand on so that they can then decide how to run their life. Uh, they, they have more of a chance to make a real decision about uh, who and what they want to be employed in, or who they want to be employed for, what they want to be employed doing. Um, you know, if, if anything at all. And, and I, I feel this is a, a more freeing idea where we have a lot of more people than who their ideas would otherwise go to waste because they they would have maybe otherwise spent their entire life struggling just to survive and their their ideas which could be huge ideas which could change the entire world never see the light of day because as i say they're just struggling to get by i don't see how anything like that could ever happen under a monarchical uh society uh, with rigid hierarchies and castes, and people just doing whatever they're told to do their entire life, never really having a say in who governs them or, or that anyone has the right to govern them. Um, it just seems like a very controlling sort of ideology. Uh, and I want the opposite. I, I would like people to break free I think it's it's the best for everybody um, just to have a platform to stand on and as well as having a democratic say in the thing that that you know dominates the majority of most people's waking hours that being your place of work your business that you're a part of um, I think everyone deserves to have a say in in that because it's one of the most important things uh, you know, at least in terms of, of time and effort, uh, it's one of the most significant things, uh, significant components of any one person's life. I hate to see that be a place where rigid hierarchy is imposed, where ideas die because they didn't come from the right person. Uh, I, I, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me when, it, when I step back and look at what the system is. Uh, it just seems like a perpetuation of the same power cycles of the past, only instead of, you know, slave and master or lord and serf, um, instead you have owner and, and worker, 
So you, you have a little more freedom than, than a serf. You don't have to <laughs> you don't have to pledge your fealty or your loyalty to your employer. Uh, most most employment these days is at will. You can you can choose a different master, uh, but that's not real. That's not real choice. You have to have a meaningful alternative to, for it to be choice, and that's where I think this this idea of having a platform for people to stand on comes in because that gives people real choice. Um, you look at right now with unemployment, that's given people a basis to, to have much more of a say in where and who they work for, you know, instead of having to take whatever job will have them, uh, they can sit back a little bit and, and be a little bit choosier and good for them, you know, good for them to exercise the, the, this little bit of freedom that they have, you know, they, they, all these employers keep saying things like, you know, oh, they're just, they, they'd rather just lay about and collect money than, than work. No. They would rather receive more money and not have to do whatever awful tasks you would have them do for less money. Um, so, yeah. So, in, 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 instead of blaming them, why not look at yourself? Why are you not offering better compensation? You know? Because... People want to work in general. There's a there's a small, very tiny minority that no matter what you do, they're always going to try to get around doing any sort of work. They will always um, try to make other people work for them. Most of these people are rich and own companies, uh, or especially have land and are landlords. Um, but somehow they get a pass, even though they're they're you know they're in the same situation as someone who's uh, just laying about and, and collecting welfare, with, of which there are not that many people who would choose that life. Um, I was just reading uh, David Graeber's book today, uh, Bullshit Jobs. I just finished it up finally. It's a really great book, and I, I would really love to cover it sometime on this channel if I can somehow get permission for it. Probably a slim chance of that, um, but who knows? Maybe we can work around uh, by, I mean... You know, we'll be stopping to do commentary on almost every single line of it. So it, it could fall under the fair use policy, potentially. But anyway, in the, in the book he was talking about, um, they, they did a study of prisoners. And uh, in, in prisons where you have a choice to either work, um, even for very little money, I mean, we're talking dollars a day, you know, much below minimum wage, um, or sit around and watch TV all day, most prisoners choose to work. And this, this is prisoners. This is supposed to be the, the, the worst of the worst, right? The dregs of society, the people that are, are just trying to scam the system for their own benefit. But even they somehow choose work over doing nothing. It, it, it starts to unravel these, these capitalist talking points of, of people would be lazy if we just gave them the things that they need. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book and uh, the end really packs the punch uh, he starts talking about UBI and it's, it's a much beefier version of UBI than, than um, boy now that name just slipped out of my head the guy who just, uh, Andrew Yang yeah, much beefier version than Andrew Yang is talking about he's talking about giving everyone an entire year's salary basically and then if they have disabilities or other sort of special needs, um, adding on to that, whatever care or facilities are, are necessary. Uh, but he's talking about how freeing that would be if, if everyone could then just choose where to work, how to work, what, what they work on. And just the natural uh, tendencies of people, most people are going to pick something. Uh, and if they, even if it's a job that may be seeming some would seem undesirable, you know, say uh, your janitor, your garbage collector, that sort of thing. If they are, oh, I'm probably going to run out of storage in this one. That's okay. Um, if they are uh, feeling like they're contributing to society, there's a lot of people that will take those sorts of jobs. You know, I, you know if I didn't have to worry about any of my bills, uh, if, if I had a all of my needs provided for me. Yeah, sometimes I'd, I'd probably choose to, to do garbage collection. Sure, I'd, I'd love to see 
uh, my neighborhood, my, my area be um, not covered in garbage. You know, that would be a wonderful service that I, that I would be able to provide then if, if given that freedom. Um, so I would probably choose to do that sometimes uh, or choose to, to, to help people reduce the amount of garbage they produce in the first place. You know, make it cleaner for everybody. And you can look at any sort of job. Doesn't doesn't matter how disgusting or gross someone thinks that that job is is all right, especially if they see its value. And that's the, that's one of the central points of of bullshit jobs is that people want to have value in their work. And the way that things are set up right now, uh, he estimates that that up to over fifty percent of the jobs in the U.S. and and places like the U.K. as well. If you took if you took them completely out of you know you know totally erased them from the 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 records um, people didn't show up to do them anymore it would make no difference on society or the economy or anything I mean other than that, a lot of people would be out of work but that's why he suggests UBI he said rather than this game of making up jobs of of you know there's things like box stickers who just you know, make sure that corporate compliance is satisfied or or there's duct tapers, people that, that fix, you know, put, put patches on really faulty systems because it's, it's somehow easier or, or at least you can't, you know, it, it's difficult to hire people to, to fix the entire system. Um, there's, there's all these different categories that he talks about um, that just, you know, utterly. Uh, and, and, this, and this is self-reported as well, that these people see no value in the work that they do or they 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 actually know that um what they do is is not productive you know that's maybe not the best word for it but um you know it's it's close enough um you know people that that uh hire a bunch of underlings just to make themselves look good basically have a bunch of yes men around or, or people that you know they can then uh, show their 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 higher ups that hey I'm an important person I have ten people working under me because I work so hard that that uh, you know I need to have ten assistants when when in reality they don't work any harder you know uh, maybe not at all really in in doing anything actually productive um, and then also so that if there's a downsizing in the company they can slash you know half of their staff and say oh look at me i'm contributing i'm a team player <laughs> people whose jobs exist just to be able to be cut if there's a problem to trim the fat so to speak um yeah so really great book i highly recommend it i've been talking about it a lot lately on stream but can't say enough good things about it um let's continue on in the, the chapter a little bit here who for life is doomed to making the 18th part of a pin, grows stupid and sinks into poverty. What did official economists propose? Nothing. They did not say to themselves that by a lifelong grind at one and the same mechanical toil, the worker would lose his intelligence and his spirit of invention, and that, on the contrary, a variety of occup... Oh, there's, there's another point that he brings up there. I know that was kind of... That was, that was a very long tangent, so I apologize if I've kind of lost you there. I... I tend to like tangents, though. I think they, they usually lead to interesting places, um, even if they're not directly connected, or, or it's hard to see how they're directly connected to the central topic of the day. Uh, but so, so he's talking about how if you had this, this journeyman, or what I, I suppose would be at this point a master, um, oh, actually back that up. That, w that would be a, a, a journeyman, because master means you own your own business in, the, in this old conception of things. Um, so you have this journeyman uh, nail maker, you know, one of the best at their, their craft. But if you force them to do just one thing, that, that, that there's no variation, there's no real creativity involved at all. That, that, that means that any possibility of them inventing something new kind of goes out the window. Whereas if they're working on a whole bunch of things, hey, you start to see how things connect together. You start to see how maybe one part of the production could uh, help facilitate another part of the production. You see how one invention may help in a, in a place that you're, you know, that, that may not be your specialty, 
uh, but it's it, it's still something that could contribute to the overall production of uh, whatever it is that you do or, or making that job an easier thing to, to do um, but again if you if you take away everyone's ability to be creative by just making them do one mechanical maneuver again and again and again again you're, you're destroying creativity you're destroying invention um, in another way it's, it's not just that you know they could be doing something else although they could be doing something else and potentially discover things and, and invent new things but even within what they're doing what their field is you're completely removing any possibility of, of you know them to come up with anything better occupations would result in considerably augmenting the productivity of a nation but this is the very issue now before us if however only economists preached the permanent and often hereditary division of labor we might allow them to preach it as much as they pleased but ideas taught by doctors of science filter into men's minds and pervert them and from repeatedly hearing the division of labor profits interest credit etc spoken of as problems long since solved men and workers too end by arguing like economists and by venerating the same fetishes okay so here, here's another thing I, I actually learned from that that david graber book bullshit jobs it's that before the rise of oh they basically he basically conceptualizes before the rise of corporations the corporate um uh, or the entrepreneurial uh, way of doing business where you don't necessarily even know anything about a business that you are starting. You just have the capital to do it and then you hire the workers who know it. The way that, that most jobs used to be and, and probably would be still in, in Kropotkin's time was that uh, as a young person, you'd be sent off to train as an apprentice in, in a certain trade. You would work your way up through the trade. Uh, you become part of the, the local guild. And um, eventually, the, the trade-off, you know, the, the promise is that if you work at this profession long enough, you'll become a master. Uh, and what a master meant is that you could then go up and set up your own house. You could set up your own shop. And in, in, in a lot of cases, it meant that you, could, you were stable enough that you could... Uh, well, I mean, let, let, let's face it, this was mostly men working. So uh, you would be stable enough, or at least in, in these, these trades, uh, you'd be stable enough to take a wife and, and start a household of your own. And, and before that, uh, you wouldn't. So, he, he, you know, one of the interesting parts about that, too, is that he said that childhood tended to be extended longer. You know, it would be, you know, you know, up until like you're 15, 20, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then you would enter a, a trade, basically. And you wouldn't start having a family, though, until you were perhaps 30. You know, it might take you 10 years to, to become a master. Um, so yeah, interesting little 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 tidbit there that that uh, the way that capitalism even looked back then was, was different than it looks now. He also he also mentioned that the modern, uh, what do you want to call it, conceptualization of capitalism is is more towards consumerism uh, rather than I don't even know what this this would be called the the, the, the guild uh, method of production I don't know but it was it was really interesting. Thus, we see a number of socialists, even those who have not feared to point out the mistakes of science, justifying the division of labor talk to them about the organization of work during the revolution, and they answer that the division of labor must be maintained, that if you sharpen pins before the revolution, you must go on sharpening them after. True, you will not have to work more than five hours a day, but you will have to sharpen pins all your life. And, and this not having to work more than five hours a day comes back to his conception of having a needs-based economy where rather than you know, supply and demand and having that dictate the market, we look at what people need. Uh, and then we try to see how much production of a given good or service there needs to be in order to meet that need for, you know, whatever the local populace plus their trading partners happens to be. And that if we, and, and if you look at that and you 
are also taking out of the equation all the skimming from the top from the owners, you'll find that people need to work a lot less. And, and this would even be true today. You take a look at the, the hours that you work and whatever job you have, uh, if you were to actually calculate, um, assuming you actually have a, you know, a, a non-bullshit job, but a job that actually contributes something to the economy, um, you could look at how much value you create uh, by whatever work you do, whether that's a good that you're producing or a service that you're rendering. Um, it's likely going to be that in the first few hours of the day, perhaps maybe just half your day, you have generated enough money for that company to pay you everything that you need to be paid, right? Whatever your contract says, you know, you, you get paid $500 a week in, in, working only four hours a day for five days a week, you generate that $500 for that company um, in profit. And we're talking about after expenses. So therefore, all that, those extra hours, who are you actually working for? It's not yourself, obviously. You're working for the owner, whoever the owner happens to be. And all of that profit goes straight to them or to their... their, their uh, you know, upper echelon constituents, um, or it gets invested in some way or another, but you don't get a say in that, basically. Um, so what Kropotkin then is saying is if we take, you know, chop that out of the equation, everyone is now a worker owner uh, in whatever profession that they do. You don't have to do that, that second half of the day working for somebody else. You can just do that part that, that generates your business enough to compensate you know assuming we're even having money anymore but um in fact the way he would conceptualize it would be that you just work enough to provide however much unit you know one three hundred sixty fifth of of the or not, you know not that exact number because you're not going to work every day but regardless you would only work enough to provide for whatever need there is you know you you, you know if you divide the year equally and you need to produce, you know, say, you know, a thousand loaves a day in bread as a baker, um, once you reach that point, you know, you don't need to work anymore, right? You've, you've, you've done your part to produce for the needs of people. Um, so there'd be a lot less work. This is all a very long way of saying, you know, that's where that, that you'd only have to work five hours a day as a pin pusher. Uh, but the, yeah, this, this idea that you would have to do, you know, you'd just be locked right back into your same profession. That doesn't make a lot of sense. There should be free, <laughs> some sort of freedom. You don't want to have a revolution just to do the same thing again. That's, that kind of defeats the purpose. Unless you really like what you do and you just want to help other people who don't necessarily like what they do. Uh... But even still, people should be able to choose their profession, even if they're good at one particular thing. While others will make designs for machines that will enable you to sharpen hundreds of millions of pins during your lifetime, and others will be specialists in the higher branches of literature, science, and art, etc. You were born to sharpen pins, while Pasteur was born to invent the inoculation against anthrax, and the revolution will leave you both to your respective employments. Well, it is this... Inoculation against anthrax? interesting i i didn't catch that last time i read this book um i was not aware there was any sort of inoculation against and maybe it ended up not working out i don't know pasteur huh of course the 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 father i believe he's talking about louis pasteur the, the father of pasteurization um probably would have been a contemporary of his i don't know just just something that stuck out that's weird horrible principle, so noxious to society, so brutalizing to the individual, source of so much harm, that we propose to discuss it in its diverse manifestations. We know the consequences of the division of labor full well. It is evident that we are divided into two classes. On the one hand, producers who consume very little and are exempt from thinking because they only do physical work and who work badly because their brains remain inactive. And on the other hand, the consumers who, producing little or hardly anything, have the privilege of thinking for the others, and who think badly because the whole world of those who toil with their hands is unknown to them. The laborers of the soil know nothing of machinery, 
those who work at machinery ignore everything about agriculture. The ideal of modern industry is a child tending a machine that he cannot and must not understand, and a foreman who finds him if his attention flags for a moment. The ideal of industrial agriculture is to do away with the agricultural laborer altogether and to set a man who does odd mm. jobs to tend a steam plow or a threshing machine. Mm. Incredibly relevant to today, because that, is, that has just been the trend in agriculture. More and more mechanization leads to less and less farmers and larger and larger farms. That's, uh, um, it has a lot of consequences. For one thing, it pushes people into the city, which, which tends to push them left just because they're exposed to more ideas and more different sorts of people that they may not be exposed to uh, out in whatever rural land they, they happen to be from. So there's that consequence. Also has the consequence that, that fewer and fewer people have any real direct connection to the, the food that sustains them. Um, and that can have bad consequences. You know, less people having a, a direct connection to the environment. It's, it's really hard to get people to care about something that they don't feel they have any sort of connection to. Um, and no amount of logic and statistics is going to force somebody to care about something either. Uh, so the way that I think of it is that we need to have more of, we have to experience things firsthand. That's how we, we begin to really, truly empathize and, and care, uh, about other things and other people. Um, and that's hard to do if you've never seen, if you've never seen a vegetable being pulled from the ground, if you've never seen a vegetable even in the store, uh, as people that live in food deserts may or may not have. Um, you may be dealing just with prepackaged stuff. You know, if, for example, the convenience store is the, is the literally the only grocery store in your neighborhood or your small town, uh, there may be no fresh produce. You may be getting all your stuff uh, prepackaged, so that that just kind of sets you back even one more layer. And I think that the 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 philosophy of permaculture can really be helpful in in helping to reconnect people to the earth that they are a part of, the the ecosystems that they are a part of. Um, these cycles in, in, in energy and nature that they are they are a part of whether they know it or not. You can do permaculture, you can you can you know the, the food production facet of permaculture, no matter where you're at. Uh, you can you could you could design your living room in a in a permaculture sense. Uh, or using permaculture principles, that is. And you know, more so than just like saying, you know, throw a few seeds in a pot and see what happens, although that's also very good. This is a much more intentional and, and thoughtful way of going about it. You have principles such as, well, just observe and interact, you know, the idea of, of doing science, you know, experiment with things, see how they interact with other things. Um, and then kind of the interact part, that's, the, that's another critical part of that observe and interact. So you kind of tweak things here and there. You see how things change. You, you really get to know it inside and out in a way that, that you know, simply just buying, just buying a plant and, and watching it grow, which is also wonderful. It, but it's not on quite a, the, the, the same deep level as really uh, realizing how much you can be a part of, of even a constructed ecosystem. Um, and important to note as well that uh, when, when white settlers came to North America, the vast majority of what they saw as just wilderness was in fact very managed forest land, especially in, in places like Appalachia where uh, the, the chestnut was king basically. Um, you would have such heavy harvests of, of chestnuts that you'd say it would be inches deep. You could walk through them. Uh, when, they, when they 
came into flower, it looked like there was snow on the mountains. There was just so many of them. They were called the, the Redwoods of, of the East. Uh, a tragic loss that they've, they've almost been wiped out by a blight, an introduced blight. Although they are coming back. You know, there's, there's native varieties that have, have now been shown to have resistance to that, uh, um, what do they even call it? I think it was some sort of, uh, it doesn't matter. It's a blight from another land, anyway. Uh, not North America. But uh, the point being, those people had a huge handprint on the land. Uh, and they, they shaped it to work really symbiotically with, with their landscape because they had to. It was, um, there was trade, but it was not nearly like the, the sort of trade that we have today. They couldn't get something from around the world if they happened to have a famine in the local area. So they had to really know how to produce things, how to produce food and produce it well. Uh, and so no wonder that they, they managed all of the ecosystems, you know. Uh, a lot of the prairies. Uh, I live on the prairie, basically, or at least what used to be the prairie. Um, actually, Minnesota is pretty special in that it's the confluence of three major biomes. We have the boreal pine forest from the north. We have the eastern hardwoods from the east. And then we have the prairie, the, the tall grass prairie uh, from kind of the, the south and, and midwest. Nope, oh, it looks like I've probably run out of my recording. Yep, that's okay. I'll get the recording off of the stream later on. Not a big deal. So, um, anyway, uh, in prairie lands, a lot of plants started co-evolving with the fire cycles that, that were maintained by the native peoples. They would burn in certain seasons, the, the prairie, and that would help regenerate uh, in a lot of cases. A lot of these, these plants became then adapted to um, needing all the, that, that extra uh, above ground stuff to be burned off so that they have a chance to compete for light again. And they, you know, diversity would, would increase when they would do the fire cycle. But, 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 but at the point being is that, again, they were part of their local ecosystem. And we can be too. We can be, at least be a much larger part of it than we are now. And I think more than any sort of documentary or, or you know, Al Gore movie, or any sort of book by, you know, noted professor so-and-so. Having real, like, literal connection with the soil, with the land, with things that grow, growing your own stuff, that makes you care. That makes you care about things like climate change. Um, and, and not everybody, but not everyone has to care in order for it to be a significant amount, or a significant enough amount to, to create the pressure for change. Um, so that's why I want to, to bring more of these permaculture ideas in. That's what I did on my, my stream last Sunday, if you want to go check that out. It's not up on YouTube yet, so you'll have to just look on the, on the Twitch stream uh, archives. I, th I think it's still up there. Um, I've been getting behind on my uh, putting out of, of videos onto YouTube, but I'll catch up with that soon. But anyway, last Sunday, did a whole stream on the introduction of permaculture. So I encourage you to check that out. So we can start together folding these ideas in, into to one cohesive thing. This, this thing, you know, my placeholder name for it is, is Solaris, which means of the sun. And it speaks to the interconnectedness of, of all of us and the interdependence of all of us. And I think this is at the heart of pretty much any leftist, like true leftist thought that you can think of. Uh, it's at the heart of permaculture. Because it talks about, I mean, the three print, the three ethics of permaculture are earth care, people care, and return the surplus to the service of the first two ethics. Um, that's all about interconnectedness. And then new urbanism, um, which talks about building community uh, and where, wherever you find yourself. Designing things in a way that facilitates community. And also providing for people. Um, the things that they need. Uh, that those are all ideas of, of that that fold themselves into new, new urbanism. And and again, we have that interconnectedness, that that strengthening of community bonds. Um, 
so yeah, I'd like to, to just mix all that stuff together into, into one big theory, which I call Solaris. Um, but it, it helps to, to kind of have that, that basis of knowledge in each of these three disciplines to, to start to see when these things come up. Um, okay, I think that's enough of a digression for now. Let's, let's move on in the chapter. The division of labor means labeling and stamping men for life some to splice ropes in factories, some to be foremen in a business, others to shove huge coal baskets in a particular part of a mine. But none of them have any idea of machinery as a whole, nor of business, nor of mines. And thereby, they destroy the love of work and the capacity for invention that, at the beginning of modern industry, created the machinery on which we pride ourselves so much. What they have done for individuals, they also want to do for nations. Humanity was to be divided into national workshops, having each its speciality. Russia, we were taught, was destined by nature to grow corn, England to spin cotton, Belgium to weave cloth, while Switzerland was to... So strange that, that cotton... Ah, I won't even get into that digression. <laughs> We've had enough lately. But it is strange that, that, that he was talking about England growing cotton. I never thought of it as cotton producing. I suppose... It's their overseas operations. I should have known. It's it's their their colonies that are producing cotton, not England uh, herself. Um, yeah, that that must be it, because it's it's not exactly the right climate for for cotton, the, the actual geographic location of England. The trained nurses and governesses. Moreover, each separate city was to establish a speciality. Lyon was to weave silk. Auvergne to make lace, and Paris fancy articles. Economists believe that specialization opened an immense field for production and consumption, and that an era of limitless wealth for mankind was at hand. Uh, limitless wealth for who, though? All of mankind? Well, in, in a certain way, definitely the, the, the standard of living has gone up, but it's gone up everywhere, regardless of, of political arrangement, uh, regardless, really, of of economic arrangement, the standard of living has just risen as as a consequence of, of greater mechanization and, uh, and and through that greater production capacity. Um, but what he's talking about here is, is is trying to channel people into these career paths where, I mean, probably generationally, we're talking about locking people in to whatever the family business is. Um, this was another thing that, that was, was brought up in the, the closing chapters of Bullshit Jobs was that that's kind of what we have today. Um, you know, David Graeber talked in the book about how, uh, how do I want to put this? Um, I don't know. I've, I've lost my train of thought with that. Maybe we'll return to that uh, later on. But these great hopes vanished as fast as technical knowledge spread abroad. As long as England stood alone as a weaver of cotton and as a metal worker on a large scale, as long as only Paris made artistic fancy articles, etc., all went well. Economists could preach so-called division of labor without being refuted. But a new current of thought... Oh, I remember what I was going to say. So basically, as, as Graeber conceptualizes it, we have... These, these doors that used to be much more wide open to people, if you wanted to get into the arts, he, he mentioned Hollywood, how it used to be much more of a truism that, that wherever you came from in the country, if you made it to Hollywood, you at least stood a chance of, of becoming an actor uh, or working on, on film in whatever way that you wanted to. But, but now because these, these powers have kind of entrenched themselves and these, the, you know, these families have entrenched themselves in film production. He was talking about how it's rare for there to be a, a widely known, widely um, used actor, and I use actor to represent you know, actors of all genders. Um, I just use it as a, a generic form. Uh, how it's rare now for there to be a, a well-known actor who is not part of a multi-generational history of actors in Hollywood. And that's precisely because of these entrenched powers that have, have taken hold. This, this channelization of, of specialization to the point where, uh, oh shoot, load to space. Yeah, okay, that's fine. 
Um, I, I'm running out of room on my computer to store things with all these, these streams, but beside the point. So anyway, to the point where, you know, you're not going to get the part unless you come from the right family. It doesn't matter who you are, how great you are, or how great you think you are. Um, you have to know someone, you know, it's, it's that old adage. You have to, it's not who, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And he's saying that in, in basically every facet of, of the creative arts, that's becoming the case. And he was talking about how that is one reason that the right has a legitimate reason to dislike liberals or, or, you know, even the left, uh, because they see it that if, if, if they were someone who wanted to pursue something creative, the door would be shut to them because they just happened to not grow up in the right place in the right family. They also see that as, uh, or they, they also see that the military is, is one exception to that rule that, that you have to be born into this certain lineage of whatever creative or managerial even profession um, you want to go into military because you are supposedly sacrificing your your safety uh, you do have a chance to then go on and, and do things like go to college um, and be a part of, of whatever uh, I guess voluntary system um, or, or altruistic system you're doing something not just for yourself for, for other people um, so that so that's why they will continually defend the military no matter what because it's one of the few doors left open to a lot of of especially poor rural conservatives um, so I thought that was interesting that 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 what he's saying what Kropotkin was was saying was going to happen is is literally happening as, as we have people, families, dynasties basically now being formed that, that channel work into the hands of, of the privileged few again and again and again. You have to go to the right university. You have to go through the right uh, film school. You have to know the right people. It has nothing to do with how good you are. There's, there's no real system of egalitarianism or, or, or uh, even a meritocracy. The doors are shut to you. By and large, and there's always going to be a few exceptions in any field, and you know conservatives will be happy to throw that up. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going with that, but um, yeah, uh, I, I find that interesting that that was very prescient on, on Kropotkin's part. Uh, induced all civilized nations to manufacture for themselves. They found it advantageous to produce what they formerly received from other countries or from their colonies, which in their turn aimed at emancipating themselves from the mother country. Scientific discoveries universalized the methods of production, and henceforth it was useless to pay an exorbitant price abroad for what could easily be produced at home. Does not then this industrial revolution strike a crushing blow at the theory of the division of labor, which was supposed to be so sound? This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. And there you have it. So that that's... <laughs> we managed to stretch... Well, I managed to stretch out uh, a six-minute, a seven-minute chapter into uh, an, hour, an hour and a half. Although I, I did have a long intro. I apologize for that. It took me a little bit longer to get ready today. I had to work today. Uh, I, got, I got called into work on, on what's supposed to be my day off. Um, there's some urgent plantings that needed to happen. And, and, and then on top of that, uh, my coworker through, through no fault of her own, her, her babysitter, uh, backed out of the last second. So she couldn't come in. So I was, I was kind of alone doing all these plantings myself today. So I'm a bit tired. I was working out, you know, it's still, it's still kind of in the midst of a heat wave. I'm sure you can hear, and I apologize for the, the, the war in the background from the, air conditioning but sorry I'm just not going to survive without it uh, I, I, I could not be comfortable uh, yeah yeah so um, anyway uh, yeah 
So, so there you have it. Uh, let's, let's bring it back to the full screen for a second. Hey, how's it going? Um, yeah, are there any questions on the on this particular chapter? I, I know I took a whole bunch of diversions, um, so maybe it's perhaps maybe you don't want to go back yourself and and reread it. You know, it's not like it's it's that long to really absorb it. But the central point is is that division of labor into into more and more atomized specializations to the point where someone who makes a pin or a nail only does that one part um, and and you know and the idea being that it becomes efficient in the whole because you can do a whole lot more of this one tiny task than if you have to stop and switch tasks and and do the entire supply chain and what his his argument is that what's lost in that is um, what's lost in that is any sort of creativity that the the uh, person might have uh, if they if they were to do you know end to end production of, of any given thing. Uh, what's lost in that is basically the the soul of the worker. You know it, it, the 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 joy of work is is squashed in the name of. Uh, efficiency and increased production. And if we're talking about a capitalist system, who is that? Who is that production going to? Who is that benefiting the most? Of course, it's it's the owner. So not only do you not get to have the creativity that you might otherwise have, or the variety at, at the very least in your work, but you're, you know, the 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 the, the excess profit that is generated by your labor is not even yours to control. So it's uh, in terms of, of work, it's a lose lose. Um, it'd be like being a fry cook at, at McDonald's, and that's all you do for your entire career. You don't move up, you don't even do the register ever if they're backed up. You just do the fries because, you know, if someone is always there doing it, you can dump out a whole lot more fries per hour than if people are switching tasks back and forth, right? That, that's the division of labor that he's talking about. But how soul-crushing would that be? You know, you would hate fries. You would hate the smell of them. You might hate, you know, I've never worked at McDonald's. You may hate the, the smell of fries anyway, just from being around it so much. I know I used to, to work at Panera. I cannot stand their broccoli cheddar because I have smelled it when it's leaked out into the warming vats. You know, the, the, the soup doesn't just get made in the back. You know, I'll let you in on a little Panera secret. The soup doesn't just get made in the back by scratch every day by some hardworking Panera employee. No, it, it comes pre-made, pre-mixed uh, in frozen bags that are put into a vat of, of very warm water. It's not 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 quite boiling because uh, you have to be able to scoop it back out. But anyways, it's put into a warmer and then you cut it open at some point, probably so it doesn't explode. I'm not, I don't you know, I never was in charge of that. But I did see certain, you know, sometimes when, you know, just because of the, the buoyancy of the particular bag, it, it leaked a little bit into that warmer. And forever, that disgusting broccoli cheddar smell has been emblazoned into my nostrils. And I cannot stand that soup. I can I can eat a lot of the stuff still there at Panera, um, but not never that again. Never again. Um, but anyway, if you're doing the same thing, you're going to... You, again and again and again you have no variety you have no creativity you just do that one thing even if it's something that's important for the world you're going to get beaten down by it as a worker it may be it may be more efficient for the boss uh, it may produce more than than you otherwise would but then again does the world really need as much of what you're producing as you are producing the answer maybe no um, and oftentimes it's it's not, especially if you're uh, looking at things like agriculture, how often they, they end up having to wait, like literally destroy food because of, of pricing. They can't get the right price for it. Some, some large producer dumps a whole lot of product onto the market at once. Price plummets. You can't make a, a profit anymore. It's not even profitable to distribute it to, say, a food bank or something. You know, you, you would... You're already losing money. You don't want to lose anymore. So you just have to destroy it. It's, it's a real tragedy. Um, 
Mm. Boy, I keep losing my train of thought here tonight. I just, I, I apologize. I'm just, uh, I'm just worn out from, from today. So, um, yeah, where was I going with that? So, so yeah, uh, you know, just, just because an, an in, a given industry produces something doesn't mean that there is a need for it. And, and that, that, I guess that's what I was trying to illustrate was that a lot of times farmers have to let food rot on the vine or, or just actively destroy it. Um, that happened a lot during COVID. Uh, there was a shortage of, of meat packers, uh, I think in the pork industry for a while because there was a bunch of outbreaks because of poor uh, personal protective equipment uh, regulations within the industry. And in, in say, a, a given meat packing plant, you may be standing shoulder to shoulder with another person. And if you're not provided the right equipment and there's a pandemic on, a lot of the, the breakouts in rural areas especially happen because of, of these sorts of, of meat processing plants. So there was a shortage at one point. And farmers were considering, I don't know if they, I'm not sure if they ended up going through it, but they were certainly considering having to slaughter a large portion of their, their hogs because it would cost too much to keep them alive. I mean, you know, you could say, hey, why are you even, why are you raising hogs in this way where they, they have to have food trucked in? Why aren't you just raising enough hogs to live off whatever land you have and, and you can manage your pasture in a, in a much more sustainable way and you would have a great point in that but you know things are what they are for the time being and so the system was overproducing because they're just I mean, that not even a demand issue that's just a, a, a that's more of a supply issue basically there wasn't a supply of a certain kind of labor and so things were inefficient so yeah so uh, this division of labor does not always lead to efficiencies. Um, in fact, you'll you'll find, if you look at any given component of uh, the goods and services economy in, in say, America, uh, things work really well until they don't, until there's one tiny disruption in a particular part of the supply line. But things have been so finely tuned... Uh, it would be like if you, if, you, if you set up a long string of dominoes and then, you know, someone walks, there's natural disaster, uh, you know, we'll use that as the, as the metaphor, knocks out a couple of dominoes. Well, all that finely tuned stuff, yeah, that's true for most countries. Uh, thank you, Cottonmouth63. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the point where we're at. That's, that's where this division of labor gets you in, in its end game. It's to the point where you have a just-in-time delivery system which in a certain way is efficient. You save on warehousing space. You have only the products you need. Um, <laughs> things work until they don't. Right. But I'm saying they work really well. Like they're super efficient until one little thing goes wrong. That, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, not just you know, things work until they don't. Well, yeah. Duh. Um, more trying to say that this is a really, this can be a very efficient system until one component experiences a shock or, or some sort of shortage uh, beyond its control or within its control that, that uh, you know, it just refuses to deal with. Um, you know, we saw that with, with say, the, the Texas power grid system where they, they, wanted, they did fine delivering power until it came to the point where the, the temperature was too uh, cold to, 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 for the power system to handle. And all their efficiency, all the savings they had in not upgrading their system to meet the, the cold standards that they may be facing in the future came crumbling back into the, came crumbling down, came, you know, blew up in their face uh, because that one little factor made the entire system unworkable. And that's how you have a lot of these, these systems working today with this hyper specialization. Capitalism has been the greatest wealth producer in history. Not entirely true. Uh, mechanization, the industrial revolution has been the greatest wealth producer although again a lot of that wealth gets it's siphoned right up to the top um to the point where people are struggling even to get by on on you know minimum wage jobs like it's, it's impossible for any person in the united states to to live on a minimum wage job um 
Canada relies on coal power plants. They are not affected by the cold. Every sort of power generation can be affected by the cold. Notice in the Texas example, it was not just the, the, uh, the solar panels and the wind turbines that they were harping on that went down. The entire system went down. I'm sure there are coal generating or, or coal fired power plants in Texas. You know, I, I would assume so. The entire grid went down and it, it was not just the production itself. It's also the distribution. You have to have wires that, that, that are, I don't know. I don't know what the, the exact uh, problems were, but perhaps it was the wires that were not insulated properly or, or, or a transformer or, you know, that was not uh, capable of dealing with the cold for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, Canada relying on coal power plants that are not effective. I mean, that, that, that doesn't even matter. That doesn't mean they're not subject to shocks of the system either. You know, you have some some hiccup in, in coal supply and those those systems will go down very quickly. Uh, it doesn't even have to be at the generation level. It can, again, be at the supply level. It could be at the, the distribution level. Uh, it could be due to natural disasters uh, disrupting things. So, I mean, OK, that they, <laughs> they're not invincible to to shocks. I don't. I don't I don't quite see the point of, of saying that they are not affected by the cold. That's cool. They're going to be affected by something. They, they don't exist in a bubble. Um, everything has its weak points. And, and the point of all of this is that, that with this division of labor sort of system, there are a lot of weak points. A lot of points that are potentially weak points. Points that, that, that will continue humming along as long as everything works as it should. But, you, you know, it's, it's like a, a very intricate piece of clockwork. You remove one little sprocket, may seem inconsequential, but it may start making your timepiece not work at all. Or it might grind it into an entire halt, depending on how critical it is to, to that system running. That's how this specialization works. You know, that, that's, that's what it leads to. Um, so we need to be thinking about these things uh, as we're, we're trying to build resilient movements as well. Uh, we need to think about, uh, uh, here's another thought. Uh, if you're, if you're thinking about organizing a workplace into say a worker owned cooperative, uh, perhaps start thinking about rotating around positions. Um, there was, oh yeah, I think again, going back to the, the book bullshit jobs, he, he was talking about a, uh, in one of the early chapters, he was talking about a person who worked for a worker on cooperative and you know perhaps i'm mix mixing this up with um richard wolf but doesn't really matter one of the two was talking about a a, a employee at who's also a worker owner at a worker on cooperative and they hated their job and were not very good at it and it showed and it didn't matter how they they were uh reprimanded or uh, tried to get on the right path, nothing worked. So what they did was they got together as an organization rather than just saying, hey, you're, you're out of here, buddy. They're like, you know, we care about you. We want you to be happy. What's going on? And it turns out there was a, a position in another part of the company that they would much rather be doing. And there happened to be someone in that position who would rather be doing that guy's job. It just happened to work out well that, that particular time. And so they rotated them uh, through and, and things went fine again. You may find then, if you're trying to organize a, a worker-owned cooperative, that rotating people through to different jobs, not only do they gain some empathy for the, their various coworkers, they, 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 I mean, they pretty much literally walk in their shoes, at least for a little bit, um, but also people have a better chance of finding their spot, you know, the spot that they feel most comfortable in. It might not even be something they ever considered, you know? It's hard to know that, that you'd really love something that you just, that just never occurs to you, right? If you grew up never seeing a violin, you, you may never know that you could have been a, a, a world-class violinist, right? That's a, you know, that's an out there example, but I think it illustrates the point. Uh, so yeah, so we, 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 can, we can talk about doing things uh, differently, um, rotating people through, and and building 
more of this interconnectedness and more of these bonds among fellow coworkers. And there's a lot more potential for that if you have democracy in your workplace, because then you can get together and make these sorts of decisions. You can try out different things. You're not just strapped to whatever agenda the boss has. or the, just Stop saying the boss. The owner has, you know? Or the group of owners. Doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, and then there's uh, ideas in permaculture of integrating rather than segregating. This is supposed to build resilience. So you come up with you come to concepts such as uh, stacking functions where say you, your, your function is uh, watering plants. You may have several systems that water plants. You may collect some water from the rain. You may pump some from the ground uh, through your own well. You may get some from uh, like municipal water if you happen to be in a city. Uh, multiple components fill that one function and also the, along with that each component does multiple things so perhaps collecting rainwater not only does it water the plants but maybe you use some of that to flush your toilets maybe you use some of that um, to uh, come up with some sort of a evaporative cooling system you know the possibilities are, are, are pretty limitless these build resilience rather than necessarily efficiency. Those, those tend to be the trade-off. You have efficiency where you're doing things with the least amount of, of you know, the bare minimum of resources. And you have resilience, which says we have multiple things that can come into place. We have multiple contingency plans or, or systems that can kick into gear. If something fails, if there's a shock to any one part of the system, we can still keep going, right? So this is, this is the opposite of, of what specialization is, is aiming for. Uh, it's the opposite of a specialized, just-in-time world. It's a world of resilience. And, and when we're facing things like climate change, um, increasing civil unrest, a lot of it due to climate change as well, uh, when we're facing political upheaval, uh, of, of different types trying to build resilient systems makes sense moving away from systems that are efficient as long as everything works as it's supposed to but then potentially not at all if one little component fails moving away from those systems makes sense to me and that's why we need ideas like permaculture to be pulled into this sort of thing this could apply to organizing as well if you are just reliant in, in your, you know, doesn't matter what your organization is. If you are just reliant on one charismatic personality to kind of rally the, 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 uh, the um, volunteers, uh, to set the agenda, to, to do all the different functions of an organization, and, and everyone else just kind of follows along, what happens if you take out that one person? You know, they, you may be involved in an action where they go to jail uh, for an extended period of time. You never know. They could be targeted. Uh, what then? That, you, does your movement just unravel? Instead, you know, why not have everybody at least do one thing in the group, uh, be responsible for one thing, but then also rotate things around get more experience doing different stuff and and not everything is going to appeal to every person but again it, it doesn't matter if it's a volunteer organization or a worker on cooperative the goal can be the same thing that you are uh building resilience through uh, cross training basically having people do all the different things that 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 is a way of stacking functions that's a way of of um, using and valuing diversity uh, and also um, integrating rather than segregating you know, rather than having very discreet people that each do one thing you have a much more robust organization if every one person could step in should the need arise and, and fill a particular role 
So I think permaculture is relevant to organizing as well. You can use permaculture principles and ethics to organize any sort of activist organization. You know, you're rallying for, for housing. Um, you definitely want to observe and interact. You want to know what's going on. You want to make experiments into the world. Uh, KJ9797 says, is this live? Yes, this is live. That's how I responded to you. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Are you new to Twitch? Or, or is it just not clear that it's, it's live for whatever reason? Or am I not live anymore? I think I'm still live. <laughs> as far as I know, I'm still live. Uh, it seems to be sending stuff out. Hopefully, I don't see any slowdown or anything. But yeah, this is live. So yeah, if you have a question, if you have a comment, we just finished up uh, chapter 15 of The Conquest of Bread, the audiobook version by Peter Kropotkin. Uh, he's talking about his his um, criticisms of, of the division of labor, which is, is you know, breaking whatever production you have into smaller and smaller tasks uh, to the point where efficiency is, is achieved, but for one thing, it's only at the, the uh, benefit of, of the owner for the most part. And for another, it, it really reduces um, a worker and their, and their actual joy, really, at doing what they do, their creativity, their means to, you know, actually have some autonomy and, and some decision-making ability as well. So, yep. So yeah, any 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 questions out there? Any any thoughts on on this chapter, uh, or anything that we've been discussing together? Um, this this upcoming Sunday, I'm I'm going to be collaborating again with with Dan Platt from the Three Lefts podcast, and we're gonna be doing like a, a Sunday fun day thing, looking at some new urbanist sort of memes and, and videos and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not even quite sure what we're going to be doing yet, but that, that's kind of the, the general sketch of, of where we're going. So if you're interested in learning more about new urbanist concepts, that's, that's something I've probably talked about least on this channel. I think I've talked a lot more about permaculture and various left theories. But if you want to learn more about new urbanism and how it can apply to whatever it is that, that you are caring about, then yeah, tune in uh, this Sunday. Don't have a time nailed down yet, but uh, we'll just say afternoon to to evening uh, if you're in the central time zone. So wherever you happen to be in the world, kind of you know reference reference that point. Afternoon to evening Sunday uh, in the central uh, central standard time zone. Uh, so yeah, that's coming up. Um, I think. That's probably going to do it. We're, we're coming up on, on 9 o'clock my time. That's usually the time I, I like to, to log off, <laughs> especially after, again, such a, such a long day of, of work that was, that was also unexpected. Got called in unexpectedly uh, to fix these problems at work. And it was rewarding, you know. Uh, perhaps sometime I'll, I'll show you some of the, the work that I've done designing and, and planting uh, various landscaping planters. That's, that's a big part of what I do at my job. Um, but I don't have that prepared right now. So I think what I'll do is I'll show you again uh, where you can find my stuff. All you got to do is go to linktr dot ee slash bread underscore theory. And there you'll find my link tree. And you can follow me on Twitch, bread underscore theory, YouTube, bread theory i should really change that to bread underscore theory but i just haven't gotten to that podcast bread underscore theory and whatever platform you use most likely i'm on uh, all the major ones except stitcher haven't haven't quite gotten into stitcher yet but I, I need to take some time so i can upload my archive there as well but uh whether you have uh i think i'm on podbean i'm on apple podcasts uh spotify google podcasts uh player fm a number of the ones that that you should be familiar with if you like podcasts you can follow me on facebook at bread underscore theory uh twitter uh bread underscore theory instagram i believe i'm also bread underscore theory i don't use the instagram quite as much 
you know, there has to be some social media that, that kind of gets short shrift. And for me, that's, that's Instagram. Uh, you can buy my art. It's one way you can help support me before I actually have made affiliate. You can look at the left signal boost database. I still got to fix that link. I haven't fixed it since last time. So that's not working right now, but you know, stay tuned. Um, left pod posting is a group I run as well as left signal boost, both on Facebook. Uh, and I haven't updated what I'm reading recently, but I plan to do that pretty soon. I, I just finished bullshit jobs and I'm, I'm starting out in, uh, Plato's Republic, which I think it's going to be a slog. I, I've, I've read a little bit of Plato before and, and other theoreticians of that time. And I just find it so tedious the way they construct things. You know, where it's like, it's just the endless questions. And certainly, and he assented. And like, I don't know what it is that rubbed me the wrong way, but it's just, I've grasped whatever point they, they're trying to, to get towards long before they've gotten there. And by the time they get there, it's just like, all right, I get it. Um, it just, I find it tedious. But it's an important work. It's one that I never got around to reading. I, I think I have a hard copy of it even, uh, but just never got around to reading it. So I think it's important. Um, recently, I've read uh, Utopia by, boy, I can't remember who it was. I read Propaganda recently. That's that's another one you guys should check out. Uh, it talks about the people that, that uh, shape... Um, tastes basically you know it has a lot of applicability to the way that the the advertising industry works uh, but it also uh, goes into how you can use simple messages and just repeat them in, in a certain way that that people will be more likely to absorb whatever you're saying so it doesn't use propaganda in it, it tries to use it as a neutral term I should say uh, it, it doesn't get into whether it's good or bad it just this is what propaganda is. Its purpose is to put an idea in your head and have you absorb the, you know, the, the few basic points that, that, that are trying to be made. So it can help you be more effective as a communicator, um, especially if you're someone that, that has to talk to the press or the media um, of any kind. It, it helps you stay on message, not let them sidetrack you or, or you know, get you flustered or, or throw you curveballs, all that sort of thing. So it's an important book. Uh, but yeah, I, you can uh, see what I have been reading or you, I, I will update it soon. Um, and, and that is, is what I have for you tonight. Uh, 